Okay, I think we can get going. So thank you very much, everybody, for your interest in this EBTC uh, open webinar. Um, we, in case you haven't really heard of us before, we're a research collaboration that works with uh, volunteers and members to promote the development and use of evidence-based uh, methods in toxicology and environmental health sciences. So those of you who've not met me before, I'm a researcher based at Lancaster University whose systems we're using today. And I'm co-chair of EBTC's Open Science Working Group. And I'm also editor-in-chief of Evidence-Based Toxicology, which is the journal of the Evidence-Based Toxicology Collaboration. I've had a very, very long interest in systematic review methods. I started working on them in about 2011. Um, but what's increasingly become clear as we kind of mainstream these methods through 2015, 2016, is that the demand for systematic review just can't keep up with our, our ability to supply it. So it's really exciting and important, the work of people like Anna, who's uh, your speaker today, uh, who are working on speeding up the process of doing systematic reviews without necessarily taking a lot of the shortcuts that are sometimes associated with this kind of accelerated methods. If you're interested in working with EBC in future or um, finding out more about what we do, we have four working groups. Um, today's talk cuts across probably two of our working groups. So our working group on evidence synthesis, which is about systematic review and evidence maps. And we also have an open science and fair data working group, which is about improving the reusability uh, and uh, uh, reusability and speed of research. Kind of projects we're doing. Uh, include developing guidance on problem formulation for primary studies. We're doing some work with Anna on um, uh, recommendations for grey literature discovery and environmental health. We're prototyping semantic authoring tools to promote the use of ontology and toxicology. And we're doing some work with GRADE on creating the first evidence decision framework for environmental health. Um, if this sort of thing sounds exciting to you, then you're welcome to join. EBC runs on a Cochrane-like model. Uh, we do collaborative projects that we uh, coordinate through thematic working groups and members support each other in conducting high quality, high impact projects of strategic value to the community. There's no fee for joining. There are not even any secret handshakes. Uh, the reason we ask you to join is just so we can, uh, you can agree to our code of conduct, which is to be a nice person, and then we can give you access to our intranet. So you can sign up through that QR code, or you can go to ebtox.org and click join or subscribe. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand you over to Anna, who is presenting on two-week systematic review, which is not work that EBTC has led, but uh, we're very, very excited to be able to give Anna the opportunity to talk about her work because it's just so interesting to us as an organisation. Over to you, Anna. Thanks very much, Paul. Can you see my slides? Give me a thumbs up. I can see your slides, yes. Thumbs up. Brilliant. Uh, so thank you very much, Paul and Sebastian and EBTC for inviting me to give this talk. And thanks very much to all of you for coming. Um, just by a super brief introduction, I'm, um, I'm an epidemiologist by training, but a methodologist by choice. And my first love is methods and evidence synthesis. So trying to make work out ways to do them better and faster. So that's what I'll be talking to you about today. So just to sort of structure the talk, I'll talk about uh, some of the challenges that are inherent in systematic reviews uh, and ways we are trying to address them. So the two-week systematic review pilot and the subsequent validation and extension to another type of evidence synthesis. Um, I'll then shift to talking a little bit about the role of the automation tools and the don't repeat our mistakes section. So the enablers of success and the things we've learned and uh, a little bit about where we want to go next. So systematic reviews are pretty cool. And if you're on this call, I know I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, so a lifted definition from Cochrane, just so we're on the same page, they attempt to identify, appraise, and synthesize all of the evidence that answers a question using explicit systematic methods, which aim to minimize bias. The pyramid background that you can see is very deliberate cho deliberately chosen because there are a lot of work. Um, so this is from an analysis that uh, a group of Americans did, uh, Rohit Bora and colleagues, about six years ago now. Uh, and they looked at 195 
registration, uh, protocol registrations in PROSPER for systematic reviews. And they found that it takes around 66, 67 weeks to do a systematic review. Now they measured the time from the point of regist registration on PROSPERO to the publication date. So we wrote them to ask, well, if you exclude the time that the paper was at the journal, what are we talking about? It's 41 weeks. So it's still quite a long time. 41 weeks is about nine months. So given all of that, it's not entirely surprising that some people have put forward rapid reviews as a solution, right? So especially during the pandemic, uh, but even before, we saw a lot of people commenting about the importance of expediting evidence syntheses because the kind of one-year, two-year timelines don't work particularly well for decision makers who are asking for these things. Um, so you see rapid reviews. Uh, I tried to work out how long they actually take when digging. Uh, if you have a really good reference that has a lot of uh, that has done this kind of work, I'd be very happy to hear. But the literature usually reports from a few days to a few months to even up to a year to do a rapid review. But it comes at a price. Uh, so in rapid reviews, you typically have uh, abbreviated searches, right? So they're not the comprehensive searches that we are sort of familiar with in context of full systematic reviews. So fewer databases are searched, for example, or only English language studies are included. There might be date restrictions. So just looking at 20 years of data, not all of it um, might skip the forward and backward citation search and so on. Changes to processes as well, instead of the usual dual screen extraction risk of bias rating, you will have modifications. So there might be single screen or single screen with a percentage being double um, and ditto for extraction and risk of bias rating. And meta-analyses may or may not be done. So long story short, rapid reviews are pretty fast, but they might miss some evidence, which means they may compromise the validity of the findings. So what do we do? Well, going back in time a little bit, uh, <laughs> this bloke pictured in the upper right, that's Paul Glasiu. I used to work with Paul at Bond University, which is in uh, Gold Coast, Australia. And I showed up at Bond mid-2016, which is ages ago now. And from the time I showed up, I saw Paul give this slide and say something like the following many, many times. Computing power is getting cheaper and faster. Genome sequencing getting cheaper and faster. But why not systematic reviews? Why aren't we doing systematic reviews in two weeks yet? So one day in October 2018, I said to Paul, let's see if we can try this. Let's see if we can actually do a systematic review in two weeks. So that's how this crazy idea came about. Um, we set out to do a full systematic review, so we didn't take any of those shortcuts that I had mentioned. But wanted to do it in two weeks, which, given the sort of timelines we all were familiar with, was crazy and, um, in retrospect, still is crazy. Um, and we used it as a case study. So we measured time to complete each individual step of the systematic review and any sort of barriers and facilitators we were coming across in the process. So this was the review. Uh, we looked at the impact of increased fluid intake for urinary tract infections. Of course, you recognize this, this is an intervention question, so we were able to restrict included studies to only RCTs. Um, we screened just under 1,400 title abstracts and included eight. We were able to perform meta-analyses on seven of those, and we included four very, very experienced people. That was myself, Justin Clark, Paul Glasiu and Chris Del, Chris Del Mar. In total, in aggregate, we had decades of systematic review experience. It took us nine days, which was a surprise even to us. Uh, so we started in the first week. This was in uh, late January in 20, 2019. Uh, week one, we worked Monday to Friday. We kind of forgot about Australia Day the following week. So of course we didn't work, but uh, we worked Tuesday to Friday at noon. So this was us on day one, approximately, but pretty close. Uh, pictured, pictured are myself and my uh, co-screener data extractor risk of bias assessor, Justin Clark. 
And this was us on the last day. <laughs> That's not us, literally speaking, but uh, that bloke, Elliot Kipchoge, was the first one to break two hours for a marathon run. So we thought it fitting. We pretty sure we felt exactly the same way. This is how this hashed out in between the start and the finish. So I won't go in detail through this table, but um, so the first column is just the number of the task. The second column lists all the tasks we did. Uh, we start with daily administrative meetings. I'll come back to that in a little bit. The rest of it you see is pretty standard. So formulate the review questions, check if there were previous reviews that did the same topic, write protocol, do searches, do a whole lot of screening, do a whole lot of extracting, risk of bias, et cetera. Here's the part that shocked us. We had expected the four of us to be working flat out for the full two weeks. So four people, two weeks is about 300 person hours. We took 61 to get to the point where the manuscript was fully complete, although not formatted for journal. That was a surprise. Um, how did we do this? If you think we stack the deck, you're totally right, I will admit, we absolutely stack that deck to make sure that we could actually pull it off. Um, the team was very, very experienced. As I said, Paul and Chris were very experienced clinician researchers, they're both GPs. Justin is a very experienced information specialist and I'm a longstanding systematic review methods nerd. We had protected time, which means we were quarantined off from the other projects. Now, as it turned out, we actually kind of didn't really need it as much because we had expected to be unable to focus on anything else at all, but that wasn't actually necessary. We took 66 person hours, not the 300 we had expected. We had daily meetings, so we lifted this from a software development crowd. Um, met every day in the morning. By morning, I mean about 9.30. Um, and we asked four questions of everybody. What did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? what were the barriers that you came across and what were the facilitators, right? So sort of a collective wisdom sharing and keeping that momentum going. And finally, we use the systematic review of automation tools. Uh, so systematic review accelerator is a suite of tools that is housed at Bond University. It's developed by folks at the Institute. So we knew how to use them and that they, they exist. We did, there was no learning curve, which again, it was, it was helpful. I want to draw your attention to something here. So just going back to that table. As I mentioned earlier, all of the tasks are pretty standard with minor adjustment of the daily meetings. Um, but what I wanted to, to sort of draw your attention to is the fact that we didn't take shortcuts, right? So all of us participated in the writing of the protocol. Screening abstracts, again, that was Justin and myself dual individual and then uh, dispute resolution afterwards. The same thing for full text, same thing for citation analysis, the same thing for data extraction, the same thing for risk of bias, right? So standard systematic review approach without the shortcuts. So to sort of contextualize this, um, because what ha happens with rapid reviews in reality varies rapid review to rapid review. I'm pulling uh, this information from uh, the guidance that was issued, that was published just earlier this year by uh, the Cochrane Rapid, Cochrane Rapid Review Methods Guidance Group. So uh, obviously protocol is recommended, of course it is. Uh, they recommend searching two of the three, I mean light central MBA. So the difference from two week SRs is that we search all three plus anything else if applicable, but those three always. Um, title abstract screen, again, the difference is recommendation for rapids is dual on, for example, 20%, the rest is single if you have good agreements. We do dual on the full, similar for full texts. Data extraction, again, recommendation for rapid reviews is a single extraction and second person verification. We do dual. Risk of bias, similarly, single rater and second verification, we do dual rating. Um, citation analysis, so the forward and backward citation search, we do it as a standard. I always worry as a systematic reviewer, as I'm sure we all do, that we might have missed something, right? So that's a sort of a safety net. Um, with rapid reviews, uh, the guidance is to assess whether you need to do it or not. And again, meta-analyses, if appropriate and resources allow, 
I love forest plots. If I can, I will do one. Um, and if not, I will force that data. I'm kidding, not always. So the question is, OK, you can pull it off once, but those conditions aren't standard. In the real world, of course, the systematic review teams aren't comprised of people who have decades of experience, right? Some of them uh, have mixed levels of experience. They don't always know how to use automation tools. Uh, systematic reviews themselves, as I said, we kind of stacked the deck. We went in with an intervention question, but there are tricky questions that systematic reviews answers, of course, uh, prognostic diagnostic questions, qualitative reviews, et cetera. We were lucky enough, intervention question, you can only include ICTs, but of course, sometimes you in include observational studies across the design. Um, and we worked face to face. We were literally office next to each other, uh, the four of us. Um, but that's, again, these days, it's not always the case. Uh, Zoom Teams meetings uh, are sort of more of a standard. And of course, there's the time zone separation. And finally, the protected time, the sort of the quarantined off time is very hard to achieve. So what would have looked? Well, good question. We decided to find out. Uh, so we validated the method in three different ways. Um, the first one was a case study of a series of 10 systematic reviews, which we did using the two-week SR method. The second one was a series of systematic reviews we did for the Department of Health in Australia. And the third one was a surprise blind replication, which I'll come back to. So the series was uh, different systematic review questions, types of included studies, larger screening workloads, and mixed levels of experience were sort of the pressure points that we pushed out when we were validating. So this is what those reviews were. The first one I've already covered, so I'll go through it again. That was the flu increased fluid for urinary tract infections. The second one was self-management of lower urinary tract symptoms, copper, pl copper plating for hospital-acquired infections. You see exactly where COVID hit, uh, prevalence of asymptomatic and zero prevalence of COVID infections, face masks, adverse events and harms. Um, bed positioning, uh, impact on GERD, hip wrecks for UTIs, uh, the impact of COVID on healthcare utilization, and finally the differences in antibiotic prescriptions when uh, the healthcare consultation is face-to-face -face versus telehealth. Different types of questions, so intervention, prevalence questions, utilization questions, mixed of, mix of included studies. As I said, we started with just RCTs and kind of dipped our toes into the water gently. Uh, but went to systematic reviews with just observational studies or a mix. Screen load uh, varied from a tiny, tiny 458 to five and a half thousand, just about. Number of included studies from five, again, pretty tiny systematic review to 81 observational studies, which is quite sizable. Uh, team size. They're generally about six, uh, but we that 81 included observational studies had a team of 14. Um, and as I said, we had initially just restricted to very experienced folks, but we gradually moved to include uh, people with some experience and people with no experience, even because the idea was to upskill them. How long did it take us? <laughs> So you can do a systematic review in one week, actually, if it's a tiny little systematic review of six included RCTs. Um, the big giant one of 81 included observational studies, which looked at the impact of COVID on the healthcare utilization, took us 18 workdays. So that's just under four weeks. The second case study was uh, a series of reviews we did for the Australian Department of Health. So at the time I was working in Australia, um, at Bond, and the department approached us to review the evidence for telehealth. Um, so just by way of a bit of context, in Australia, telehealth wasn't widely used or available, um, except in very narrow circumstances prior to the pandemic. So, of course, the pandemic happened. The question was, well, we enable it temporarily. Do we keep it or do we do away with it at the end? Uh, so they came to us and said, look, review all of the RCT evidence in primary and allied health. 
which compares telehealth provision of care, so live phone or live video to face-to-face -face provision of care. And they wanted to know for any patients, any gender, any age, any conditions, and wherever you can conduct systematic reviews. We got 12 weeks, which isn't a lot of time, but the ministerial timelines are sacred, so 12 weeks was all we had. Um, we used the two-week systematic review methods, and we had, we had eight people working on this, uh, mixed levels of experience. So Paul and I were involved, of course, as were uh, six other people, ranging all the way down to a research assistant who had never done a systematic review, so it was quite an experience for her. We were able to synthesize evidence for 21 topics. Now, they weren't all full systematic reviews. Nine of those were full systematic reviews. And I will brag about this till my dying day. Our, uh, our report, our findings, uh, informed the government's decision to make telehealth permanently available to all 26 million Australians, which is pretty cool. Um, there's eight publications that came out of it, every single one a systematic review, and there are a few others in progress. The third one that I'd mentioned already, uh, that was a surprise. So a team at Macquarie University, which is in Sydney, uh, blind replicated our first two week systematic review in November, 2020. Um, so they used our published systematic review, which was published in, earlier in 2020, and the systematic two week SR methods paper. At one point I got a email that we all sometimes get asking for a paper or for some more details. They asked me to send them supplementary materials because that went with the systematic review because the publisher apparently didn't put them up or there was some issue with the links. So I sent it to them, but I didn't suspect a thing. <laughs> Later, I found out that's exactly what was going on, that we're trying to do a blind replication. They included six of the same studies as we did, six out of eight. Um, the other two, I mean, they were tricky inclusions because they required us to contact authors to find out whether these studies were actually includable. One of them was an Italian, one of them was a Turkish study with a strange sentence that kind of, in the discussion, that kind of suggested to me that there might be a reason to include it, so I wrote to them. And we were very, very lucky that they responded very quickly and provided us with all of the stuff. Um, so we actually were able to include them. So I suspect that's what the difference was. Um, they took 11 work days, uh, 15 calendar days, 63 person hours, so pretty close to hours. Um, they had three people working on it, though, not four, so <laughs> massive props. Uh, fidelity, pretty close for the methods, uh, 95. Um, 63 for the outcomes, and we worked out what the issues were. Um, so it had to do with reporting of the validation set. We didn't report it. Uh, studies which we used for forward backward citation and the original results of the robot reviewer assessment of the risk of bias. We didn't report any of that. Um, strictly speaking, you're not required to, but if systematic reviews are replicable, then we definitely need to do better. So I personally learned a few lessons from that. Moving on. Um, question was, could you actually use this for other types of evidence synthesis? And in 2022, a colleague that I've never worked with, but um, I've come across a, a few conferences, approached me and said, can we do a scoping review using this method? And it turns out, yes, we can. So these are print screens of her Twitter account where she was live tweeting this as this was going on from uh, day one to day 14. Um, but what she was interested in, and she's a dietitian, uh, she wanted to find out what types of evidence exists about the current use and extent of consumer co-design in nutrition interventions. So our team was five dietitians and nutritionists, uh, two methodologists, including myself, and one consumer expert. We actually wrote a blog about this collaboration describing that partnership as part of World Evidence-Based Healthcare Day back in 2022. So it's, uh, it's available to read if you're interested. Uh, we used the JBI scoping review methods and the two ECSR processes, so the team had complementary skills, as I said, uh, mixed levels of experience. There was one person there who had never done a systematic review or a scoping review or any kind of evidence synthesis, several that have done several and uh, some very experienced folks. Uh, projected time for the screener data extractor, yes, for the content experts, no. Uh, we had daily meetings. 
Um, but we also used a Slack specifically for this project, which worked really nicely because we actually all kind of kept it running live the whole time. Um, and we used automation tools, but with some adjustments because um, tools are often set up for systematic reviews, but not for other types of reviews. And Methods Wizard, which is a tool we used for the uh, protocol, is set up for systematic reviews, but not scoping reviews. So here's the timeline. We had a couple of meetings to decide, is this a good idea? Should we do this? The answer was yes to both. Um, first day was the 23rd of May, 22. The last day was the 9th of June, uh, so we got to a complete manuscript that was ready for external feedback in 18 calendar days, so three weeks. Uh, if you're interested in the size, just to sort of contextualize this, uh, 8,100 references screened, uh, 19 studies included, and uh, we submitted shortly after completion, just a few days that following Monday, and uh, it was accepted. Um, not very long later. Uh, so the whole process from the first day of the scoping review to the accepted manuscript was 13 weeks, which was pretty fast. Now, I promised I'd say a little bit about automation tools. So automation tools. Now, and on hard full disclosure, this is not the process we used in the first one because some of these tools didn't even exist back then. But this is what it looks like now. So for the protocol, um, and again, all of these tools are systematic review accelerator tools, suite um, of tools which are freely available. You can just Google them. Uh, methods Wizard we use for the protocol. Uh, it steps you through all the sections of the protocol, and at the end, it automatically spits out the written up version. Uh, for search design word frequency analyzer on the validation set to identify terms. We draft the search strategy in Medline, uh, put it through Search Refinery, which visualizes your search, so you can work out which terms are useful and which terms are not. And then once we're happy with the strategy, we use the Polyglot Search Translator to translate automatically into other database syntax. Title abstract full text screen. We use deduplicator Screenatron and Disputatron, which do exactly what they sound like. Um, there's heaps of others. You can use Covidence, Rayan, Appy Reviewer, JB Summary, and others still. Data extraction and risk of bias are a bit of an unconquered frontier. There's, um, if you know of really good toys in that space, please let me know. Um, forward and backwards search, use SpiderSight and Revman Replicant. Uh, we use for meta analysis write up. You upload your ARM5 file from uh, from Revman and it spits out text that goes with that. Nothing will write your systematic review for you yet. We still need humans for this, but uh, at least the uh, from the protocol, you can reuse the methods and of course the introduction. Key points, um, important to try out systematic reviews, uh, sorry, automation tools. Some you'll love, some you'll hate. Uh, back in um, 2020, we did a survey of uh, HTA clinical practice guideline and systematic review committee to, to ask them what tools they are using, what are they abandoning, loving, etc. Funnily enough, the answer to what most people are using are most commonly Covidence, uh, Rayan, Distiller SR, and Revman. Tools that people abandon most frequently, the exact same four. Uh, SR Toolbox is a searchable database of automation tools for evidence synthesis. I think it's currently offline, but hopefully coming back soon. And as I mentioned, the SRA is uh, a suite of online tools that are available for anybody to use. So this is the don't repeat our mistakes section. Here's what we've learned. Um, team required. So there seems to be a proliferation of reviews with very few authors on them of late. And I'm wondering whether that's an issue with people not giving authorship credit, which is its own problem, or people just doing systematic reviews in tiny teams, which is concerning because you need those complementary skills, right? You need your methodologists, you need your content experts, screeners, data experts, of bias people who do all the hard grunt work. And as I mentioned, because in two week SRs we do daily meetings, you need somebody to be the cat herder, to basically manage the team, ask those questions at a daily meeting, and be bossy with people who are uh, needing to be, be bossy with. And of course, people wear multiple hats on reviews. Inexperienced reviewers. So as I said, 
you can include inexperienced team members on a two-weeker. We have. Um, you don't want to scar them for life. You want them to enjoy the process. So what we do is we pair them up with somebody who's experienced. Um, so if they're doing screening, for example, we will pair them up and we will also assign them a lower workload. So let's say if you have two pairs, you can maybe ask the pair that includes the inexperienced person to do 20%, not 50. Um, ideally, you keep it manageable per team because of course it takes work to upskill an inexperienced reviewer. Protected time. So that was, we had the quarantine time on the first two weeker. We kind of uh, played around with that a little bit, although we tried to keep it as much as possible on others because it's, um, as it turns out, it was not as crucial as we had anticipated. As I said, it took us 60-ish hours to do the first. It wasn't the 300 we had expected, but we found that it's key to as much as possible to protect the time of the screener extractors. Um, others a bit less so, so the folks who are doing the searching, you need them mostly up front. And of course, later on when you do citation, topic experts ad hoc. Um, and of course, later on when you're um, interpreting your findings. Uh, we've experimented with various modifications because as I said, it's really hard to get protected time. Um, you can do it three days a week and save your two days for other projects or just do this in mornings only. Um, an empirical question, which I don't know the answer to is, and if somebody does, I would love to hear, is whether protected time might be easier to achieve in consultancy or HTA health technology assessment bodies. Um, maybe that's true, maybe it's not true. Um, the daily meetings, we find the live meetings work. Um, they can be face-to-face, -face, they can be mixed face-to-face -face online, they could be online only, but they have to be live. Uh, we can supplement and we have supplemented them with various other async comms options, so the Slack channels, Zoom, et cetera, all of that seems to work as well. We found that when we replace the daily meetings, the daily live meetings with asynchronous approach, strictly asynchronous, it tends to extend the timelines. I'm guessing it might have something to do with the ongoing momentum and possibly the guilt factor of, you know, meeting every morning and saying, here's what I did yesterday, here's what I'm doing today, maybe. Automation tools, uh, they're there to be used. Um, and, but again, don't scar inexperienced people for life. Uh, that's not what, that's not the uh, industry we're in. Uh, again, we pair up the experience with the inexperience, but keeping in mind that of course it always takes time to upskill somebody. Uh, we don't have too many inexperienced folks on the team and we mentor them um, and decrease their workload generally so that they can sort of keep up. Timelines and complexity. So huh, timeline scales up or down with complexity of the review. And we saw that in that case series of 10, where you could do one a one week systematic review with a tiny six included RCTs, or you can do a big one with 81 included observational studies in under four weeks. Um, pretty big time savings estimate over, uh, over the BORA estimate, which is the 41 weeks. Uh, and I think it compares, of course, favorably to rapid review timelines as well. There's also a spillover effect. Uh, so we noticed that when we were, when I was still working at the Institute, um, not all the systematic reviews we did were two week systematic reviews, but even the ones that weren't sort of started to go a little bit faster because bits and pieces of the method were adopted. For example, the daily screening uh, for the daily meeting. Um, one example was a clinician led. So this was a hospital based person uh, systematic review, which uh, they completed in 16 weeks, which is again, comparable to rapid review timelines, but it was a full systematic review of included 32 RCTs, so pretty sizable. So where to next? Um, so far, we've tested the method on intervention prevalence, adverse events, utilization, those types of questions, and extended it to scoping reviews and clinician-led reviews. We've done some workshops, webinars to upskill folks and coached external teams uh, doing them and have also included folks uh, from uh, outside the Institute in our two-week systematic reviews to upskill them. And we've, as we were doing all of this, we've identified a uh, need for various automation tools. As I mentioned, the methods wizard, 
was initially developed after we identified the need for it. It steps you through the method section of your protocol for your systematic review, um, so it helps. Um, and then we're starting to extend some of these. So for example, working on methods wizard for scoping reviews for non-intervention questions, systematic reviews, et cetera. So that work is ongoing. Where next? This is my Christmas wish list. So I think there is a scope for extending to weak SRs. In particular, the screening and diagnostic questions are bugging me. I think it's definitely one of the uh, priority tests that we should do to see if the method still works. It's an empirically testable question. I suspect it will, but find out. Network meta-analysis, again, I suspect it will work just fine, but it's a testable question. Living systematic reviews and living other types of evidence synthesis, uh, I've not tried, but I would very much love to try. And ask for health technology assessments and similar types of evidence synthesis, I don't know. But again, I think it would be really cool to try. Now, you may have noticed that most of the topics have had to do with health or allied health. And one of the sort of the things that I'm really keen on is to go beyond. So, of course, systematic reviews and other types of evidence syntheses are getting much, much, much more common in environmental and toxicology topics, education, and a few others. I think it'd be very cool to try out to see if the method still works. Um, and if you've got any ideas, I would absolutely love to hear about them and uh, please reach out. Now, before I wrap it up, I just wanted to sneak in a really small sneaky opportunity to do a quick uh, plug for World Evidence-Based Healthcare Day, which is a collaboration of the major evidence synthesis bodies. Um, so it's led by the JBI folks in Adelaide and uh, involves Cochrane, Campbell, et cetera. 20 October of each year, we celebrate World Evidence-Based Healthcare Day to raise awareness of the need for evidence to inform decision-making. There's going to be, around that week, there's going to be events, webinars, talks, uh, Twitter threads, et cetera. So if you'd like to join, please absolutely do. We'd love to uh, hear your thoughts and experiences. So I am going to stop here. Um, this is my contact information if you'd like to reach out. Um, I don't tweet as much as I used to anymore. I think that's true for a lot of us, but that account is still there. Um, and uh, the Systematic Review Accelerator tools that I have mentioned are on the SRA Accelerator website and help guides and demos for many of them are also available. So I'm gonna stop here. That All right. Fantastic, thank you so much, Anna, for that tremendously interesting presentation. I'm just trying to grab your email address so I can pop that in the chat for everybody. I just, they've got it. Yeah. There it is. So email address going in the chat, in case you want to get in touch. I think it would be really interesting, like just responding to some of like many slides, obviously, um, and lots of interesting things. It would be super interesting, I think, uh, from an EBTC perspective to look at maybe applying or testing these two week methods on a toxicology or environmental health related um, systematic review question. That, that would be very exciting to do. So anyone think on so. this call would like to get in touch. I don't want to steal your thunder, Anna. So obviously they should use you as first point of contact. But if you would consider doing that with EBTC, that would be wonderful. Um, Absolutely. So we have like your one people, my people will talk, yeah. So we have uh, one question so far, but I think, you know, I have a couple of questions and this this one question we've got from Sarah Rosenberg that I think we can also build on. Um, she was asking which the most often used and abandoned automation tools are out there. And I think there's also an interesting question of how you keep up to date with which tools can be used, how well they're working, you know, how how much validation work you're able to do. <laughs> Do you kind of use like community use like as a heuristic for the quality of a tool uh, when it comes to automation? Do you have any kind of thoughts or comments on that? OK, so and the how survey... much they cost, sorry, and how much <laughs> they cost. OK, thank you. So that's that's a whole lot of questions. Thank you. Uh, so I'll try to address each in turn. And then if I miss something, please let me know. So the survey we did back in 2020, towards the end of 2020, when we were all a little bit ANSI because of COVID. So we reached out to the systematic reviewer, clinical practice guideline, and HTA community to see, what are you guys using? What do you like? What don't you like? Um, 
And the funny thing is, one of the questions we asked is, which so sort of what tools are you using most often and which tools have you abandoned? You used to use, but you abandoned for whatever reason. The answer to both questions is the same, right? So although slightly different order. So the four tools that people adopted most commonly were Covidence, Rayan, Revman, and Distiller SR. And the exact same four were most commonly abandoned. <laughs> so people use them, they decide, they like them, they don't like them, um, and switch to something else. And I mean, uh, for example, Covidence Rayan have a lot of very similar functionalities, but there's certain things people like about specific one that it can do or some, sometimes it can't do. Um, and if they decide, look, I don't like, for example, the color options, or I don't like something else, they switch. Um, how do I keep up to date? <laughs> I always worry that I'm missing something cool, uh, which is which is tricky. As I said, the SR toolbox is a great database of everything. And to answer your question about cost, it actually lets you sort by whether a tool is free or whether it's not. I do. So one of the questions in that survey I had mentioned was, what are some of the barriers to adoption? And cost did come up because. You know, I mean, we're not all working in high resource, high income settings. The money may or may not be there. Um, so it matters. Um, so when you do use the SR toolbox, and as I mentioned, it may be a little bit, maybe offline just temporarily, but it should come back. Um, it lets you sort. Uh, so for example, let's say you want to see if there are what kind of screening tools there are. It lets you say, okay, I want to pick just screening tools and I want to pick just the ones that are free. It lets you search like that. Now, I have absolutely nothing to do with these SR toolbox people. I just think they're doing a really cool service for the community. Um, other stuff, obviously the literature, right? So publications in the uh, systematic reviews journal, uh, the J. Clinepi, people mentioned the cool things that they do. Um, so those are sort of the main sources. And of course, the word of mouth, you know, you talk to people. I was just at ICESER meeting in uh, Prague just a couple of weeks ago. So of course, you hear about new things that way as well. Um, have I missed any parts of your question? I was just kind of a, a very broad question. So I think that was a very good answer. Uh, so we have lots of other questions as well in the chat now. It's really starting to come to light. So I think uh, the first question we might as well get with, and again, this is something that I wanted to ask you about as well. So, you know, two of us coming at you. So Arkosh <laughs> Jorviak is asking what step still takes the most time? Is it data extraction? <laughs> Are there automation solutions for that? Can we piggyback on top of that? Like a question, because um, I was just wondering if there are areas of like the search and kind of a uh, evidence finding process which maybe are also potentially time consuming particularly if you've got challenges with how well indexed say a given like domain might be so i don't know if you can answer both of those at once but so bang on exactly right data extraction takes forever right um there are tools that can do certain things. So for example, Robot Reviewer used to be able to extract your Pico. It didn't always work terribly well, but it worked kind of okay, but Robot Reviewer no longer exists, which is a bit of a pity. Um, um, other tools, there are various other tools. And again, we've played around with some of them. I've never found anything that would do all the hard work for me. <laughs> I think we call them undergraduate research assistants. <laughs> So that extraction is sort of the area. We're sort of okay with screening. We're okay with the automation of searching, but the data extraction, I think there's still a lot of work. And fortunately, a lot of work, a lot of people are doing a lot of work um, to try to sort of speed that up right now. Um, and again, if you come across something cool, absolutely please share in the chat because I would love to know. Um, search process. Hmm. It's searching is great if you're doing your standard intervention question on health topics, right? That's the sort of the easier or easiest case study. Um, I'm currently working a lot in social care topics, which gets tricky because it's not very well indexed in PubMed. And PubMed and Medline is where we structure a lot of our searches against because, for example, the Search Refiner tool, which lets you visualize your search strategy and get rid of terms that aren't performing well, is tied to the Medline language search. Right, so this works well if your search includes Medline, not so well if it doesn't, right? So for people working on topics outside of that, it becomes trickier 
and that needs to be acknowledged. Um, so the sort of the shorter answer to your question is search process is great in health. The second you move to trickier topics like environmental, education, criminology, justice, etc., it gets harder because um, a lot of the tools are sort of set up exactly for those health questions. Um, so I think we still have a lot of work to be to to do in those spaces. Excellent. So thank you. So I think this naturally segues to a question that uh, Laszlo Balkany has on the use of large language models. So I mean. I think the question is quite broad and it's like, you know, you discussing those, doing experimentation with them, where do you anticipate them being potentially most helpful? Um, if you have any thoughts or comments on that, that would be great. Um, so I will confess, I am, I look at my developer colleagues like superheroes because they do dark magic as far as I'm concerned. I could not answer that question at all. I love automation tools, I use them, but in some ways it's a little bit like using a remote control. It's like, I push buttons, see what happens, but what happens under the inside the black box, I don't know and I don't necessarily understand, so I wouldn't be able to say anything useful or informative about that. Okay, so I think, so there is some work that's being done, so this is just for the information of people on the call. So James Thomas from the Epi Centre at University College London, is doing some work with large language models and using like LLM prompts and experimenting with different LLM prompts as kind of prompt engineering to see how well they perform for uh, basic data extraction for uh, from primary studies. They're, in some areas, they work quite well, like if the identifying populations and exposures or interventions, they work quite well. For, for more complicated stuff that's more of a kind of a knowledge claim or a judgment, obviously they do less well. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how much progress has been made. I think they've got a paper that they're, that's in, in process at a journal at the moment. And then they're going to be, I think they're going to be at this year's Evidence Synthesis Hackathon in Newcastle, which is an event EBTC is very proud to be sponsoring this year. So I should be able to get an update then. Uh, and then also, <laughs> I think there's a lot of interest in using large language models, or increasing interest in using large language models to help with the documentation of systematic reviews. Because if you can provide an LLM with well-structured like high quality labeled data and it's a well-trained llm that's not trying to kind of you know that's not going to hallucinate facts outside of your data set then they could be very very useful for very fast creation of first drafts and things which then obviously human would check for accuracy and completeness but you certainly get a lot of completeness because it's very easy for machines to do the the, the difficult, tedious job of remembering everything that has to go into a manuscript, it can do that very well. It's whether or not it gets it accurately that is more challenging. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there as well. So it'd be interesting to see how that space develops over the next probably 12 months. I think it's going to be pretty quick, um, like when we see some maybe tools coming online Fingers. for that. Fingers crossed. Uh, so two-day systematic yeah. reviews in a couple of years, Paul, is what is to, where well, we're going. Yeah? It'll, it'll take a couple Today. of hours off the end, right? Because it'll solve, dissolve that first draft problem and it might, it might help with some aspects of the data extraction. I think the data extraction is going to be quite, it's still going to be tricky. Great, it'd um, be great if we could do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, oh gosh, there's loads of questions now. So we're not gonna be able to do them all justice, but we do have a project management question, which I think we should we should talk about because project management is important and boring, right? Um, so Emily Seneth is asking, uh, who happens to be chair of EBTC's Evidence and Decisions Group, by the way, uh, Ask if you encountered any difficulty around communicating expectations and time commitments to less experienced team members. Can you share more information about how you onboarded them, whether you had any attrition of team members, um, this sort of thing? So I've actually been lucky. I've not had attrition. Uh, people want to do these things because they're kind of excited. So I think it might be a little bit of a selection bias in the sense that the people I deal with are not the sort of your average systematic reviewer. These are people who are excited about automation, about doing crazy things like two-week SRs. Um, so I don't know. I mean, how would I, so I've not had problems sort of communicating that Look, this is what's going to happen, right? Um, it is important to be straightforward. So right, as I mentioned with that scoping review that we did as a test of the method, we actually had a couple of meetings ahead of time to sort of talk with the team and say, look, here's what's going on. Are you interested? Do you want to participate? Do you have the time? 
right? All of that has to be discussed transparently. Um, I mean, you sort of don't know it until you're in the middle of it and then you survive, you come out at the other end, you will be very tired. And after the first one, we made sure to be able to, communi to, to communicate that to people very clearly because it is intense. Um, but as I said, we've been very lucky that sort of folks I've, I've, that have joined us on our reviews have been very excited about the method and uh, I've had a great time, I think. At least that's what they said to my face. <laughs> so I guess, like, just as a kind of a follow up question, because there, there's another side of the expectation management equation, right, which is to the potential, I'm going to call them your clients because I can't quite think of a better word. But when you're doing like providing a two week, say, systematic review service to somebody like with the telehealth systematic reviews that you did, because um, you kind of, I guess it's analogous to kind of like doing like a, like a kind of a sprint project or something if you were doing some software development and you can't you can't sprint all the time <laughs> and it's not yeah. always the case that sprinting constantly gets the best results so is there you know is there a temptation maybe for some like say groups to think okay a systematic review can now be done in two weeks we should therefore ask for two week systematic reviews all the time because the telehealth thing struck me that that struck me as a very big complicated very high stakes question and for the policymakers to kind of want to answer in 16 weeks slightly startled me in a way. Because um, even if it's big and important, take your time. But obviously you did a great job and you managed it. But so how, how well do you think, how sustainable is it? How well do you think you can, you know, manage the expectations of people who want two week systematic reviews? Are they always desirable? Do you have any thoughts or reactions to that? Um. How sustainable. So the challenge now is to get the method out and get as many people trained as possible. It's still very, very niche. I mean, it's been around for, I think, four or five years now, but it's still pretty niche. And some people are still hearing about this for the first time, which is why I always sort of seize on the opportunities to talk about it, to sort of say, hey, there's this cool thing. We could totally do this. Um, so the resource is a limitation. Not enough people knowing how to do this. Um, I think automation tool or tools are pretty widely used. Almost all of us use it, so that's not an issue. There's an organizational change issue with this sort of trying to sequester at least portion of your time to devote to one project. And it's a sort of a considerable portion if you're doing the uh, screening, the data extraction. So that part is different because we're sort of, in academia at least, I can't speak outside, we're kind of used to working on 17 projects at the same time, jumping from one to the next. So the sort of focusing on the one and having a block of time, a good block of time set aside for that, that's tricky. Now, I was very lucky at the Institute. I had a boss who was all over these kinds of crazy things. So talking him into these ideas wasn't hard. But I could see how in other settings, coming to your boss and say, look, leave me alone for two weeks. I will knock this out, but I can't do anything else. That's a hard sell. That's a hard sell. So there's a resource question. There's the organizational sort of culture question. Um, and those are tricky, and I think those will take a little bit of time, maybe a long time. I'm not sure, but I'm being an optimist. Is it always feasible to do a two-week systematic review? Absolutely not. Look, in theory, you could do 26 of these a year. Would you want to? No, you would be so exhausted. <laughs> so maybe it's a question of coming out with you know, uh, saying, okay, well, these are the priorities that we have and these we would like to have the answer to very quickly. So these we'll use the method on and these others maybe we'll, we'll sort of take our t a longer time with the sort of the conventional approach or even accelerate some, some like somewhat accelerated conventional approach. But that's a really good question. I need to think about this some more. I guess so. Uh, I mean, there is a question about the potential for um, burnout of people in the teams. Like if you've got someone doing eight hours a day of screening, like what point do their eyeballs right. melt? Um. Yeah, it's hard. So that was one of the sort of challenges with that telehealth review. We started in October, which is already late in the year. So we were, you know, the usual brand of tired. Then there was the Christmas break, which was good and bad. Bad in the sense that it sort of slowed the momentum down a little bit, but good in the sense that we came back relaxed and refreshed. Um, so, they are hard and as i said we communicate to people that this is going to be intense uh, but i don't think you quite understand how intense until you're in the middle of it but i again if it's somebody who's inexperienced we try to lighten their workload and pair them up with somebody who is experienced so we don't burn them out because that's absolutely not the goal 
And if the timelines get extended a little bit, you go from two weeks to three weeks or three weeks to four weeks, usually not the end of the world. Unless you're, again, unless you're on a super strict timeline like uh, ministerial imposed timelines, in most cases, systematic reviews, if they get done in three weeks, that's still incredibly amazing. If they get done in four weeks, that's still pretty incredibly amazing, right? Because we're working, we're trying to get away from the sort of culture that says 40 weeks is standard, right? You do it in one tenth of the time, pretty freaking awesome. Um, so there's that. So not everything has to be done tomorrow, right? It's not always no. the urgent. So yeah. No, and as I Good. said, so sort of that we call them two weeks because nostalgia. But um, as as I showed, like some of them can be done in one week, some of them take four weeks. All of this is okay. Nobody's going to judge you and say, oh, well, it's not really a two-weeker. That's not how it works. The point is just to speed up what we do and speed it up massively because I think uh, the rapid reviews people are actually right that the timelines to which we synthesize the evidence is, doesn't really work for decision makers and that needs to change. And I think in this, we absolutely agree. Very good. Okay, so we have time for one last very quick question uh, <laughs> before we let everybody go. So... Uh, there's someone here, and this is a nice short question, so you should be able to answer this quickly. So someone here says, so Neil McDonald says they've increasingly received review feedback asking if a search strategy has been peer reviewed. Uh, so is that something you do? If so, is it something you incorporate into your timeline? I don't know if Justin ever has or hasn't. Um, formally, probably not. Informally, probably yes. For the ones where I design the search strategy, I usually, I'm pretty decent, but I'm not a search specialist. Uh, so I usually work closely with a proper librarian who does them. Um, but I think, I think you're right. I think we're going to have to incorporate this step formally and see if that makes any impact on the timelines. So again, this is one of those things that we sort of didn't really used to be required to do by uh, the reporting checklist, but now we are. And uh, I think that's that might have a small impact, probably not a huge impact, but we'll have to find out. Very good. Thank you very much. So I think that's top of the hour. So thank you ever so much for your time. Um, I hope oh, you really so enjoyed this presentation. A lot of positive comments in the chat, so I think we can take it that they did. Uh, I think as the last word, if you are interested in doing more of kind of this kind of stuff, and working with people like Hannah in the future, then I strongly recommend you join EBTC's Evidence Synthesis Working Group. Uh, but, uh, just go to ebtox.org and you should be able to do so from there. Um, no obligations, but if you'd like to, <laughs> then we'd love to see you. Okay, thank you, everybody. We'll distribute the recording sometime next week uh, once we've kind of got it downloaded and coded up and then distributed on YouTube. And uh, really, really pleasure to have you, Anna. And uh, uh, thank hopefully you so much we'll speak again very soon, won't we? Lovely. Take care. Bye, everybody.